please put your hands together for Chris Grayson and Mark Newland. Uh, good morning. Well, thanks everybody for dragging yourselves out of bed to come and join us, and uh, we're going to talk about IPv6 this morning. My name is Mark, and this is Chris. Hello. And we're going to answer Gary Coleman's question here and let you know that we're going to be talking about the future. And the future, as Chris and I interpret it, is water powered jetpacks that go underwater. And it's a really cool place, but also in the future, and has been in the future for the last two and a half decades, is IPv6. And IPv6 is growing in prevalence, especially in the last number of years. It's made a number of improvements over IPv4, and we've had some observations that it has a number of potentially uh, insecure defaults and uh, fail open scenarios. And we have been uh, getting interested in IPv6 as a result of some security research we conducted with our friend Logan Lamb in 2017. And we have this hypothesis that because of the automatic configuration nature of IPv6, that you might have devices or networks that are connected to the public internet, which are not intended to be connected to the public internet and are not configured intentionally in that way. So we did this, uh, uh, you know, started getting interest in IPv6, and we had this hypothesis that we have these devices potentially connected to the internet. And to validate this, what we need to do is actually find the addresses of these potential devices to see if they're out there. And it turns out that this problem of actually discovering IPv6 addresses is non-trivial and is pretty hard. It's so drift into a wall. Uh, every direction, a wall. <laughs> and so we're going to start with some background on IPv6 and our motivations for doing this work. We're going to talk about the security implications of IPv6 as we understand them. We're going to talk about the difficulties of scanning this address space, and then look at two different methods we used for generating addresses, both some honeypotting and then some modeling. We're then going to talk about IPv666, which is the tool set that we've open sourced, and then we'll conclude with a few results. And I want to preface this by saying, you know, Chris and I are not network engineers. We've been learning about IPv6 through the course of this project. We almost certainly have something wrong, so when we do something wrong, please let us know. We're happy to learn and grow, and we appreciate your feedback. So let's talk about, uh, you know, what is IPv6, and aside from the fact that it's the future. So once upon a time, we only had IPv4. We had this 32-bit address space, which gives us around 4.3 billion addresses. And that is a lot of addresses, but from the standpoint of doing network scanning, it's actually not too bad. And we can scan a single port across the entire, single TCP port across the entire IPv4 address space from one machine with a high bandwidth in a few hours. And so this means it's possible to hit every IPv4 device uh, pretty trivially. We can't do that with IPv6 because of this much larger address space. And on the surface, we have 128 bits, which gives us um, approximately 313 commas worth of addresses, which is something that we can't actually brute force. So here we have a chart of the percentage of users who have connected to Google over IPv6. This is a chart spanning one decade. On the left, we have 2009, very little connections over IPv6, started to increase in 2013, 14, and then now we're at close to 25%. And so this is, of course, only users connecting to Google, but this is a pretty good indication that IPv6 adoption is growing and is going to continue to grow. And as a result, as security practitioners, it's something that we need to think more and more about. And so in addition to getting this larger address space, IPv6 has some improvements to how routing happens. Uh, we have a more efficient packet header for more efficient packet processing. Instead of doing uh, primarily broadcast with also multicast, everything is now a variant of multicast with IPv6. But the big paradigm difference with IPv6 is this concept of automatic configuration. And so if you have an IPv6 enabled device and you connect it to an IPv6 enabled network, it will automatically configure itself to get an address and route to the internet. And because of this automatic configuration, the uh, you know, potential problems we see are that you could have devices that are explicitly configured to use IPv4, but are automatically configuring themselves to use IPv6 and potentially touching the internet without explicit knowledge. So we did this research in 2017 targeting some Comcast equipment and services, which got us going down this path. And so if you're interested in this, we gave a talk at DEF CON 25. We ended up with 26 CVEs in Comcast gear. And some of the vulnerabilities were only exploitable over IPv6 and only exploitable if you knew the IPv6 of a target device you were trying to attack. And so an example of this is this vulnerability in Xfinity Send to TV. This is a service where you can display a website in uh, the web browser that your set-top box runs on your TV. So everything the set-top box displays on the TV is a web browser. You go to the site, you put in the URL, and then it loads in the browser on your TV. 
Now, if you're a Comcast customer, you have your cable modem, and you can log into that with your 10001 address locally, but Comcast support can access it remotely over a specific IPv6 address on a specific network interface on the box. Now, that is not accessible over the public internet, or not normally accessible over the public internet. Uh, however, if you are coming from a Comcast-specific network statement, you're able to hit that IP address and load that web UI remotely. What we discovered is that the uh, the set-top boxes exist in the same protected network segment, and so we were able to put in the IPv6 address of any target customer's gateway, log in remotely with hard-coded credentials, but to do this, we had to know the IPv6 address of that target device. And so this was our first hint that maybe being able to discover these IPv6 addresses would have some pretty interesting security implications. And now Chris is going to walk you through some of those. Yeah, so we uh, had a lot of fun with that project. Hi highly encourage checking out the video. There's some pretty uh, funny attack chains in them. Um, but basically, you get to the point where it's like, okay, we don't really know anything about IPv6, but we keep, so like, that was when I learned how you can take an IPv6 address and put it in a browser URL bar. You put, like, square brackets around it, and that's how it works. So, like, that's the level of knowledge we had then. Um, but we're like, okay, this looks intriguing. It keeps coming up. Let's learn a little bit more about um, potential security implications of IPv6. So here's a number of things that kind of caught our eye. So one of the things that we got yelled at very loudly on the internet for was for saying that NAT is a security control or can be seen as a security control or even if you say it like super tentatively, people will rip your head off. So I'm still standing by the fact that I think NAT has a positive contribution uh, to IPv4 network security posture. Um, and so what NAT is, is network address translation. And it's what gave us 10.star, 192.168.star, 172.16.star. Um, and it was never meant to be uh, something that would give us better security. It was basically like, oh, we're running out of IPv4 addresses. How do we solve this problem? Okay, let's take a number of network segments and make it so that different groups can reuse those segments. And then when they're communicating with the open internet, they're going to be behind a single IP address. Um, and so this is what, this is the technology that gives you your 10.star address when you connect to your home Wi-Fi, right? So the fact that when you connect to your home wireless network, the fact that the open internet can't just start routing random traffic to you, that you have to like explicitly configure NAT bypass if they're going to be able to talk to you while you're, while you're on that segment, um, that's what NAT gives us. And network address translation by default is no longer what you get in IPv6. There's actually no such thing as private address space in IPv6. Everything is either a public address, uh, a unique local address, which is kind of like a uh, private address space, or a link local address, uh, link local address, public address, or a unique local address. And um, basically everything is public. And we're going back to a, to a world where we have to rely upon firewall rules, which what's the default firewall rules for like most distributions? There aren't any. So I, there's a lot to say for secure by default when things just like are in a better secure th state out of the box. We get a lot of kind of like good ground from that and we're no longer getting that out of the box in IPv6. One interesting thing uh, to the chagrin of IPv6 engineers is that actually does exist in IPv6 and I can't imagine being the folks that were like, wait, but we have all these addresses, please don't give us that again and then we have it. But again, it's not the default. So uh, if you've looked at your firewall rules and been like, well, I want to make sure that I'm blocking all of my IPv6 traffic, uh, and you look at IP tables dash L, you see that your input chain is dash J reject, you think you're, hey, I'm all good. Turns out that has nothing to do with IPv6. There is a separate table, and there is a separate utility, and it's just IP6 tables. Works the exact same, same with add rules, everything that you would expect to see with IP tables, but it's a separate rule set. So if you haven't looked at your IP6 tables rule set and you have an IP6, IPv6 enabled uh, interface, you might want to double check that. So your existing firewall rules on IPv4 are, uh, no longer, are not going to be effective. So here's a picture of some slacks. Uh, it's not the same as the slack that I'm about to talk about. Uh, Slack is the uh, stateless address auto configuration protocol. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the design that has gone into IPv6 is from lessons learned in IPv4. Uh, and one of the lessons that was learned was, you know, back when, back when we're talking about like the OSI model being created and, and like going up the network stack, it's like, okay, well, we don't have that many computers connected to ARPANET. Let's do, uh, we'll just like statically configure IP addresses, right? Because like nobody's going to have personal computers. Um, so obviously that was not correct, uh, you know, hindsight is 2020. Uh, but we come up with something called the dynamic host configuration protocol. So when you join your home network, uh, you're actually going to be communicating with your DHCP server, uh, and that's going to be 
basically managing address space allocation uh, within the network that you're currently in. So this is how you actually get an IP address, but you need a DHCP server to do that, right? So you have an external dependency that is pretty much required for you to continue going up the stack on the OSI networking model. And so that's kind of like a violation, you know, that's, that's not a great design. And so the solution to that in IPv6 is something called Slack, Stateless Address Automatic Configuration. And it's a way that your device can provision itself an IPv6 address without there having to be a DHCP server in the mix. Basically, if it can talk to networking equipment, it can get information from that networking equipment, use its MAC address uh, or a derivation of its MAC address for a bunch of bits in, the, bits, bits in the address, announce, hey, I made this address, is anybody else using it? And if nobody responds, that's now your IPv6 address. So what that means is you don't have to set up a bunch of like external dependencies for IPv6 to start working. Your devices can do it already. <laughs> and what makes that worse is that it's the preferred communication protocol. Uh, so all modern operating systems support it. All modern networking gear supports it. All modern operating systems prefer it as well. So that's to say that if your device can establish an IPv6 connection with a remote server, it's going to prefer that connection over IPv4 in most cases. Um, and so we read about this and we're like, well, yeah, okay, but like, let's force them for, for, for the odd cases where this might not be true. Uh, and we were able to empirically observe that if something can talk to you over IPv6, it will. We did a bunch of like engineering we didn't have to do around how we got the DNS server set up so that we could like trick somebody to like from going from IPv4 to IPv6. There are like literally zero hits that did it. Uh, so if something can talk IPv6, it will. This is another thing that we got yelled at for, or at least I got yelled at for. Uh, my, you know, humans are creatures of habit, so I, I like to think about kind of the psychology behind how folks configure things, how folks like see things, and to me, what I had in my head with IPv4 is that there's a one-to-one -one mapping of IP address to interface. Um, and like even when you can have multiple address, IP addresses on a single physical interface, like those tend to be virtual interfaces at the operating system level. So if I say like VLAN tag 500 on F0, uh, I'll get another IP address, but that IP address is going to be with the F0.500 interface, right? So separate interfaces. Uh, so I, you know, in my mind, there's always a mental model of a one-to-one -one mapping of an interface to an IP address. And then was yelled at and told that no, you can actually put multiple IP addresses on a single interface in IPv4, but it's not something that I'm very familiar with. So maybe this is just an oversight. Um, but in IPv6, you have at least two IP addresses for every interface. One of them is going to be the FE80 address. And this is an address that basically anybody that's on your layer two broadcast network is supposed to use to communicate with you. So different protocols that you're only supposed to be talking about in very like small, like only to your neighbors, you can still talk layer three to them with that address. Um, and then you have all of your public addresses. So you can have a number of public addresses for a single interface. But so why does this matter? Well, again, going back to like the human psychology side of this, how many people have ever configured a server where it's like, what interface do you want to listen on? Oh, that's zero. Well, to me, that was always like, I'm effectively picking an IP address, right? And I'm choosing the interface that has an IP address on it. Now, if you pick F0, like, I don't know how you're supposed to design a service that only listens on FE80. Is it that we specify a specific IP address? Uh, is it we specify an interface and an IP address? I'm not entirely sure, but given that creature, humans are creatures of habit, this is a change that I feel like you might be listening on IP addresses that you don't intend to. So my background is mostly red teaming uh, and, and like software engineering and, and things like that. Uh, so my entire experience around ICMP and IPv4 is like ping scanning. Uh, that's, that's the main thing I do, trace route, what have you. Uh, but for a protocol that is the internet control message protocol, I was always kind of like, why is this not more critical? I feel like we could just block ICMP everywhere and stuff would still work. Um, not in IPv6 anymore. So in IPv4, we have the address resolution protocol, and this is a way to go from a layer two address to a layer three address. So it's basically broadcast out and say, hey, who's got this IP? And somebody says, oh, that's me. This is my Mac. Talk to me. Uh, and that's how you're actually able to go up the, the stack. Um, you don't have ARP in IPv6. We have the neighbor discovery protocol, which does effectively the same thing. Um, but to one of, the, one of the points that Mark made earlier, we don't have broadcast in IPv6. We have multicast and you can achieve broadcast and then some with it, uh, but that's one of the big changes is that NDP is actually over multicast, um, but it's part of ICMP v6. So if you were to just say, I'm going to block ICMP v6 everywhere, you're literally not going to be able to route traffic. Um, 
So this is, again, another breaking change, or not breaking change, another dis difference between what we're seeing in IPv4 and IPv6. Multicast is really cool, and it's been around for a while, but my understanding of it with IPv4 is that it takes a bunch of effort to get working, and then nothing really uses it. Um, multicast, if you are to spec with IPv6, you support multicast, um, because you can actually achieve a broadcast with a link local multicast. It's just like a more powerful version. And what multicast does uh, is, at least uh, in IPv6, the left-hand side of the address dictates the scope that you want to broadcast to. So this is basically how far do you want this message to be propagated. The right-hand side of the address defines who are the recipients. So there's an address that says, propagate this ad infinitum and make sure all of the UPnP services get it. For anybody that's messed around with UPnP services before, that seems to me like it might be problematic. Uh, so we did have multicast on IPv4. It was not something that was widely supported. It is something that is in the spec, has to be supported with IPv6, so all your networking gear is going to support it. And this is another kind of avenue that we haven't even looked into yet, is like, how could you abuse this? So like, taking it all together, we do a bit of research, we learn a bit about IPv6, and we come up with this list of things that's like, okay, maybe, maybe we should look further into this. So it works out of the box without any configuration. All your devices support it. All your devices prefer it. Your networking gear probably uh, supports it as well. Uh, there's no such thing as private address space. You're not getting that uh, by default. So unless you have somebody configuring your firewall rules in intelligent ways, uh, if, if you're talking IPv6, you might be just like, on the open internet, your existing firewall rules don't apply, uh, and you can't block ICMP like across the board everywhere uh, without breaking all of your networks. And then you can send a single packet out and get it to just be propagated to a ton of hosts. And so we look at all of this, and it's like, okay, let's go find some IP addresses and validate that this is actually a problem. And then we run headfirst into the problem of like, oh wait, it's kind of hard to find these IP addresses. So now we have this expectation that if we're able to you know, find these IPv6 addresses, that we might be able to use them for interesting security purposes. And so again, with the IPv4 space, we just brute force scan the entire space, but we can't do that with IPv6 because there's just not enough time in the universe to actually test every single one of these potential IPv6 addresses. And pslack also makes things harder. So pslack is the privacy extensions for Slack. So as Chris mentioned earlier, with Slack, the address bits, or the host bits, which is the write bits of the address, which is the device identifier part of the address, is derived from the MAC address of the network interface. Uh, the, ho the network bits, or the left bits, are derived from the gateway that the device is connected through. But this means that if you have your laptop, for instance, that is connected to two different networks, on one network it will have one network set of network bits, another network, another set of network bits, but the host bits would be the same in both cases. And this means that if you are connecting to a network service, that network service can potentially track your device by looking at the distinct host bits that are derived from your MAC address, even though the network bits have changed. So the privacy extensions for Slack introduces entropy into those host bits. So again, we have the network bits on the left, host bits on the right. Even in a network that's a slash 96, which would be a small IPv6 network, we still have 32 bits of entropy. And because we have high entropy in devices that use pslack for address generation, this means that it's going to be difficult for us to actually use any kind of modeling to generate these addresses. So that this means we're actually looking at two different problems. So we have the first problem of trying to find pslack hosts, which we probably can't do through any type of modeling. And then we have the other half where we're looking for non-pslack hosts, which we suspect that we might be able to use some modeling to generate. So for finding the pslack hosts, we decided to try some honeypotting techniques. And on a high level, we spun up a server, installed a web service, SMTP server, DNS server, and worked to try and get client devices to connect to these different network services. And the idea was that if we can't generate these pslack addresses, we can have these client devices connect to us and collect the addresses that way. And so we did a combination of generating some traffic organically by posting links on Twitter and GitHub and so forth. And we also used a completely legitimate ad network called Pop Ads, which allowed us to pay for traffic to come and hit these services. Which if you, if you uh, Google Pop Ads, the automatic completion at the time was like Pop Ads virus, Pop Ads malware, Pop Ads removal. So you know it's good. But it's cheap. It's cheap. 
So here uh, we started by setting up a Honeypot DNS server. We have a bind server, and as Chris mentioned before, we did some, uh, some tricks to try and have clients who are attempting to do name resolution over IPv4 or connect over IPv4 reroute to IPv6. And none of that engineering was actually required because all the devices will automatically prefer IPv6. So here we have on the bottom a graph of our DNS uh, queries over time. This is over the course of the last year or so. And we have a few spikes where we paid for traffic with these ad campaigns with pop ads, uh, but in general we have this kind of organic tail that goes down and not a lot of remnant traffic. That said, we did receive multiple hundreds of thousands of DNS queries to this buy-in server. And so a quick note on pop ads, this is a plot of over approximately 90 seconds of HTTP requests that have come in from a pop ads campaign. And this is showing that we gave pop ads $50, they turned on the fire hose and it quickly spun out and they gave us some number of tens of thousands of requests. And while they claim that these are actual users that are you know, clicking on, on a link, visiting our website, we suspected that may not be the case. And one of the common referring URLs that was uh, hitting our site was just a blank page with an anchor tag pointing to our site and a cryptocurrency miner. And I, I, I know that, you know, we, you saw people do that. Yeah, I mean, like, like, yeah, so whenever I open a new tab in a browser, it always has a link to IPv6.exposed and a crypto miner, and apparently a lot of other people do that as well. And, and what's also somewhat interesting about that is that's literally all that was on the page. It's just the JavaScript uh, URL and the anchor tag. So how was that anchor tag getting clicked? Unless there's JavaScript in the cryptocurrency miner that was doing it, which kind of indicates that it might be more than just like a cross-site scripting payload that, that is hit. This also led us down another rabbit hole investigating this, uh, this web browser called Kotkot, which was uh, giving us a lot of suspicious traffic and uh, something to, to look at if you're curious for this type of ad fraud. Uh, so then we set up this Honeypot web server um, at ipv6.exposed, and the idea here was that we would have users that would visit this website. The website was serving over both IPv4 and IPv6. We had the images served over IPv6 so that if people were trying to load the page over IPv4 for whatever reason, that we would still try and get them to load some of the resources over IPv6. But again, everything just worked and happened over IPv6. Then we also have a web RTC payload on the page which would attempt to enumerate the local IPv4 addresses as well as the local slash public IPv6 addresses and post those back to an elastic search instance we control. And so for people to visit the site, we first have a potential DNS request, we have requests to the web server, and then we have the web RTC post back so we can collect IPv6 addresses at different points during the user interaction. So here we have a uh, plot of the requests over that last year from on top the HTTP requests and on bottom the post backs from that web RTC payload. And it's on the scale of tens of thousands of requests for the HTTP server, but then only on the scale of thousands for the web RTC postback. And so the expectation there is that we're probably not having every single request to our website come from an actual browser, or it's coming from a browser where it's uh, some of this ad fraud, where the tab is getting closed immediately and that sort of thing. But we still had uh, some number of thousands, uh, about five or 6,000, uh, WebRTC requests that actually loaded and posted that data back. And so through this, we were able to collect some number of uh, like 90-ish thousand IPv6 addresses from the web server. So excited about this, we decided to do a Honeypot SMTP server. And our objective here was to see if we could get requests from client devices to this SMTP server. So we used a service called Mailbait where you put in an email address, it signs you up with a bunch of lists. And unfortunately, this didn't have the results we were hoping. Uh, in the end, we had mostly infrastructure devices connecting to our SMTP server, so that would be you know, Hotmail, Yahoo Mail, that sort of thing. And so this was kind of a dud and didn't really get us any useful data. So with the honeypotting, over the course of 10 months, we netted 92,000 IP addresses, but it was kind of a slow process and we spent at the end like, what, $1,000 on this, and so not a, not a very cost-effective way to do it. And so the results are suboptimal, and so we decided to focus our efforts elsewhere. Um, and one of the, the things we, we discovered is that we had this big list of addresses and we were pretty excited that still we had 92,000 um, IPv6 addresses from client devices that had high entropy and appeared to be pslack. Uh, now, or appeared to be pslack, and what we did not know though is uh, what we learned after we got, had the internet correct us, uh, there's something called IPv6 ephemeral addresses. And so this is functionally similar to ephemeral TCP ports, except it's, as it sounds, ephemeral addresses. When we went back to scan these 92,000 addresses, most of them were offline, and in hindsight, it's because they were all ephemeral addresses and not actually viable for this purpose. So the honeypotting in general was completely bunk, and so we switched over to modeling, which Chris will walk you through now. It's, uh, it's not every day that you get to learn that a significant part of your research project was uh, completely wrong. Um, so that was fun. 
uh, but you know, it's, it's a learning experience. Um, so you know, we, we have these addresses that have significant entropy in them, and we've kind of removed them from the equation. Uh, they're not ones that we're particularly interested in anymore. Uh, so let's take a look at the ones that don't have a lot of entropy. And here is just a list of IPv6 addresses that come from some public data sets, and they're sorted. Um, and if you kind of like squint your eyes, you might notice that it appears that there's a decent amount of structure in these addresses. And that's what we were thinking, that like, you know, humans will uh, continue to allocate them in patterns that they uh, that are recognized. They'll take learnings from IPv4, bring them to this. They have to be organized in some way. Uh, but at the end of the day, it turns out that, and there's a, there's a separate paper that I believe found six different clusters of like how addresses are laid out. So. Again, humans are creatures of habit. Uh, but we, we thought that, yes, there has to be a bunch of structure in here. So what do you do when you're trying to build a model of something as a uh, you know, self-respecting computer science person? Blockchain. Clearly, you use machine learning, because um, it's the solution to everything. Uh, and I'm not a machine learning expert. Uh, I know enough to be, no, I don't. Uh, the, I'm going to explain this in the way that I had it explained to me. So there's this idea of an autoencoder. Um, and so you see this picture of an eye here. Uh, your eye has a lens in it, and it's got these light rays coming into it. And if your lens is completely uh, perfect, it will have basically a perfect flip of those uh, light rays on the back of your retina, and that's how you see, right? Um, if your uh, lens is damaged, the image that you get on the back of your retina is going to be messed up in some way as well. Um, an autoencoder is similar to this idea of a lens. So we want to build a lens that is partially broken. Uh, so we want to build a lens that is maybe like 98% accurate and then 2% error. And what's cool about this is the lens is broken in a way that whatever you project through it, even though it's erroneous, it is representative of the structure of the underlying data you use to build that lens, right? So the idea is if you build uh, like erroneous lens that has uh, this like 2% error in it, then you would take an input data set of like 1,000 IPv6 addresses that we know, pass it through this lens, and the lens, instead of giving you a perfect reflection out the other side, would have a permutation on those addresses, and the differences in those addresses would be uh, basically representative of the structure in the addresses we used to build the lens. Um, and so that's how an autoencoder works. Supposedly, I could be completely wrong about all of that. I don't know. Uh, but we were like, cool, we have a friend who knows a lot about machine learning, and he was helping us, and of course, this works super well. <laughs> Except not at all. Uh, so with only two weights, um, which like basically only two floating point values uh, of, of a lens, we couldn't build a lens that wasn't perfect. Uh, so in all cases, the lens learned like everything there was to know about the IPv6 uh, address structure and learned like, oh, you're, you're trying to predict this stuff. So you would take an input data set, pass it through, expecting new ones out the other side, and it would just give you back the input data set. So it was like really not helpful. Uh, and, and you know, our friend is very busy. We didn't want to pester him too much more, but like he, he took some stabs at this and, and couldn't get it working. And so we were like, all right, well, maybe, maybe we're not on the right trail. Um, and then we saw this project, and this is another really cool project that we highly recommend, uh, where some folks associated with Akamai had a massive corpus of data, I want to say on the order of billions, because um, they have like basically IP addresses from a content delivery network, and they analyzed the entropy breakdown of those addresses. Um, and it turns out that there is a significant amount of structure. This is basically like, <laughs> yeah, you know, machine learning didn't work, but hey, it, it, it does appear like we might be on the right track. So we're like, all right, let's get real dumb about it. Uh, and so we made probably the dumbest model we could, uh, and here's how that works. So we have an IPv6 address, and we break it down into the 32 nibbles that comprise the address. And then what we want to do is look through all of our data and create a probability distribution on a per nibble level to be able to predict the next nibble if you know what the value in the current position is, right? So I want to say that, you know, for all the addresses that I've ever seen before, when uh, the value of OXA is in nibble position one, what's the probability distribution for the following nibble after that, right? Because then we can generate left to right. So what do we do? Break it down to those nibbles and then basically create a counter and say, okay, for the zeroth position, we have OX2, and the next one is OX8, increment the times that we've seen that by one. For the first position, the current value is OX8, the next value is OX0, increment that counter. And we do that for every single IP address that we have in our data set, and now we have per nibble probability distributions uh, based on a, a current value in a, in a current position in, in an IP address. And then we are able to generate addresses from that model pretty easily. 
So the addresses that we're generating start with OX2. Uh, all public addresses that I know of start with OX2, part of the spec. Sweet. OK. For position 0 and value OX2, what are the probabilities that we've seen for the following nibble? So we take all of those probabilities, we create a weighted die, we roll that die, and whatever it comes up with gives us the value for the next position, rinse and repeat all the way down the line until we have 16 nibbles, and now we have an address. And so we do this, we generate 10 million addresses, and we ICMP scan all of those, and like 50,000 of them were live. And we're like, oh my god, we solved the problem. We didn't need machine learning. Uh, and so, you know, the, for anybody that's done like research projects before, it's like you get really, really good results, and you're like, oh, you're, you're on this high. You're like, yes, we did it. And then like, like, like reality sets in, and you're like, that feels weird. Like that, that, like that was a really dumb model. There's, how could it possibly have done that? Uh, and so then we dig into the problem a little bit, and we find out about these alias networks. Um, can't tell you why these exist. Haven't really dug into it very much. We just know that we hate them, and they're terrible. Uh, <laughs> But an alias network range is one where every single address in that range is actually matched to the same host. So you can have like a slash 32. So two to the 96 different addresses are all being routed to the same machine. I'm guessing it's for like parking networks before they, they get allocated for, for customers and stuff like that. But when you have a like probabilistic model and a like feedback loop into it, uh, and you're finding like out of 10 million guesses, we made 50,000 right ones, and you feed those back into the model, you end up with a model that's really good at generating addresses that effectively mean nothing. So within like 48 hours, we would like generate 10 million and like 99, 9.9 .9 million of them were alive. And it's like, th no, this is not, like, <laughs> that, this is not it. Uh, so we had to find a way to identify these networks where every address in a particular range would respond positively. And so here's how we did that. So again, let's say that this address is one that we found to be live through our initial like ping sweep. And we want to say, OK, is this a real address or is it an alias network? So we take it and we wrap it in a slash 96. And then we generate eight random addresses in that network. Right? So eight random guesses out of 4.5 billion. We scan those eight addresses. And then if 50% of those addresses respond, then clearly that slash 96 is alias. Either that or you're really good at guessing and you should go buy a lottery ticket. Uh, but because you're, you're not going to guess eight addresses in, out of 4.5 billion and have like five of, half of them alive, like that's, that's a really low chance of that happening. So we get to this point and we say, OK, we're pretty sure that this slash 96 is aliased. So the rightmost 32 bits of this address uh, is within the alias network range. So now we need to find the actual offset for how big is the network that's aliased. So we take the address, we map it to bits, and again, we know the rightmost 32 bits are within the alias network range, but we don't know about the leftmost 96. So we do a binary search. We take the ones that we don't know about, and we take half of them and flip them, right? Because if every address in a network range is going to respond, then if you flip all the bits in any address in that range, it should still respond, OK? So we take the right half, right half of those 96, we flip them, and then we do an ICMP scan. Uh, and out of those, we're going to get one of two responses. In one case, we don't get a response. What does that mean? Well, then clearly the offset for where the network, is, the network starts and ends is within those bits that we flipped. So at this point, we know that the bits we didn't test are clearly not part of the alias network. And now we've narrowed down the, the uh, offset to be within the range that we did test. If we do get a response, we know that all the bits that we tested are also in the alias network range. So we include them in the ones that we know as alias. And now the unknown bits are the leftmost 32 and uh, or leftmost 48. And now we uh, rinse and repeat. So it takes five or six iterations, but this finds the exact offset where, where the alias network range starts and ends. So did this work? Yes, it did. And this actually got us some results. Um, it's not perfect yet. Uh, but we have built and released a toolkit. The official v0.2 release is today. Um, and it's called IPv666. It's got five different utilities, discover, alias, blgen, clean, and convert. And here's how the scanner works. Basically, first, we generate a bunch of addresses, and then we do the ping scanning. After we get responses back from that ping scanning, we group everything into those slash 96 networks. And for each one of those networks, we now do this uh, alias tests. Is the network aliased? If so, find the actual like offset. Uh, and now we found the alias networks 
for that iteration. We then take the responses we got initially and remove any from it that exists in those alias network ranges. Uh, and we take those good addresses after it and feed them back into our probabilistic, like a terrible probability model. Um, take the results, write them to a file, and then clean up all the state that we needed for that given loop, rinse and repeat. Uh, and this actually appears to be somewhat effective. The discovery utility is probably the one that you'd be most interested in. We've tried to model it after like, existing network scanning uh, uh, tools. So you can basically point it at a network range or just point it at the global address space. And it'll go through this process. You can control the bandwidth, stuff like that. Um, alias is a utility that we built just to do the alias network range testing. So if you have an address or a network range that you believe to be uh, alias, you can pass it to this and it'll actually do that boundary seeking. Uh, BLGen will just take in a list of IPv6 uh, address ranges in CIDR format in a file and add them to your blacklist. So if there's certain ranges that you don't want to be testing, um, you can include them in this way. Clean will take a file that has IPv6 addresses in it and remove all the addresses in it that are in your current blacklist. Basically, there's one master blacklist that's stored on disk. And then convert is just something that will enable you to uh, take a list of IP addresses in one format and write them to a file in a different format, like fat ASCII hex, ASCII hex uh, binary stuff like that. And so we have given a uh, similar talk at uh, another conference, and we don't like to give the same talk twice. And so we would made a bunch of updates. Uh, we had our initial release, uh, and we got a bunch of really good feedback. It worked, but you had to like get this custom version of ZMAP, um, install it, get it working, put it on your path, clone this down, do like go build, had to invoke it from the right directory. There's a bunch of stuff that made it hard to run. Um, and Huge thank you to H.D. Moore for his feedback around what we should prioritize, and it was basically make it work out of the box. Uh, so our v0.2 release was all around that, and today you can, if you have Golang version 1.11 installed, you can do go git, and then this URL, and then it'll be on your path, and then you can just start playing around with it. It only works on Linux, um, and, but as long as you have an IPv6 uh, enabled interface, you should be able to do this, and it'll just start working. Um, we have a blog post uh, with some more information about this. Uh, then there's a repository as well. And now Mark is going to talk about some of the results we found. So we built this tool. We know that it can now discover these IPv6 addresses. And so we wanted to see what that actually meant in terms of what can we find. And so we ran IPv666 discover for a period of a little over a week at a host that was throttled at a 20 megabit per second connection. And over the course of that week, we discovered 53,388 unique IPv6 addresses, and these are non-aliased addresses, and about 80% of those were not in any publicly available data sets. So this demonstrated that we are able to actually discover these IPv6 addresses that are not previously publicly known. And then we took a specific network range from that list and decided to see what happens when we scan within a specific network and Completely see... Completely unintentionally. So, so we... we, we Yes, and so we, we scanned this specific network range, which is a slash 48, and lo and behold, it happened to be from an ISP, and we discovered around 5,000 consumer premises uh, cable modems. And this was kind of a flashback to our, our work from 2017 with Comcast, and we you know, didn't intend to get back into that space and go in that direction, but it was kind of fun to see that you can actually discover a lot of these consumer premises devices using this tool. And in the end, with the different uh, iterations of running this tool, we've collected approximately 84,000 IPv6 addresses. And so we decided to do some network scanning and see what was actually on there. And of these 84,000 devices, 8.3% of them, almost 7,000 running telnet services. And so we're actually discovering a lot of networking equipment. So this is both consumer premises gear as well as enterprise networking gear. And also 54 of these devices were running OpenSSH 3.5, which is 15 years old. So it's uh, uh, kind of interesting to see. And the reason we're discovering, or that we think we're discovering, a lot of this networking equipment is that networking equipment is oftentimes going to have an IPv6 address at the top of the range. They might have a slash 64 and then colon colon 1 be in the first address. And this is represented in this entropy, distribu entropy distribution of our model, where we have high entropy in the network bits and low entropy in the host bits. So this is a visual representation of the fact that we're finding these low addresses in these ranges. We have a number of improvements we're going to make. Right now, the tool is fairly heavy in disk I.O. because we serialize state to disk at different parts during the process. So we're planning to iterate on this to do all of that in memory. There's also some parallelization we can do. So right now, we have, for example, the address list candidate generation 
happen in serial, and then next we do the actual scanning. We can do those things in parallel. Uh, so some improvements there under the hood, but the functionality is all pretty baked in and looking good. We want to add in the sixth gen different uh, address generation algorithms, and we also want to do some searching around the initial hits. What we mean by that is we can say we first find an address, we can then fan out from there and search for neighboring addresses to enumerate these different networks instead of doing the specific network targeting. And in conclusion, we've started by providing background on IPv6, as well as our motivations for doing the work, some of our security implication thoughts. We've talked about the problem of brute force scanning the IPv6 space. We talked about our hunting potting techniques, which failed, our modeling techniques, which failed and then failed a little bit less, our tool set IPv666, which we encourage you to use and give us some feedback on, and then we looked at some of these results. There is some related work in this space. There's the Entropy IP paper in 6th gen we've talked about, the paper clustering of IPv6 address structure, which is also a good read, and then there's the IPv6 hit list project. And now we have a few minutes for Q&A. I think the, the, the mic, there's a microphone down here for anybody that would like to have any questions. A, a variable size. We've seen them, um, I, I think, down to ni slash 96s and all the way up to, what, slash uh, 32s? Yeah, yeah, I think there was even like a slash 8 that might have been aliased, yeah. so, yeah. All right, well, thank you.